So yeah, it's great to have you here, Jan. So I just uh, uh, want to introduce you first. Just give me sure. a sec, please. Uh, so Jan Peters is a full professor for intelligent autonomous systems at the computer science department of the uh, Technical University of Darmstadt. And at the same time, a senior research scientist and group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems, where he heads the Interdepartmental Robot Learning Group. Jan Peters has received several awards. Just gonna mention a couple of them. The IEEE Robotics Automation Society's Early Career Award and, and several uh, paper awards. Uh, he received an ERC starting grant in 2015. And in 2019, he was appointed as an IEEE fellow. So very happy, very happy to have you here, Jan. And uh, your talk is on learning robot skills from, from data. So now I'll handle it to you. All right, thanks a lot. So can I can show my screen? Yes, it does work. Okay. All right. Do you guys see my screen? Okay. No, do you see the wrong one? Uh, yeah. Like so. Yeah, we can see your screen. Yeah. Do you see my, I, this is really getting confused today. But, uh, <laughs> Do you see either the presenter view or the other view? This is a presentation view. Okay, so I go now the wrong way around. Great. Um, that's so bold to... No, I think this is the right view, isn't it? Was it? I think it was the right view. It was the correct view. Okay. Alrighty, so I'll just leave it like this then. Okay, so what I... Basically, but it doesn't show you the video. Does it show you the video? Yeah, yeah, it is showing you. Yeah. Mauricio, I don't hear you. Yes, I oh, can see yeah. the video, yeah. Sorry, of course I don't hear you. Hi, Mio. So what you see here is, is a very, very old version. Basically, it starts right at the beginning of robotics. And um, right after the first robot was ever built, they released this video as a commercial. And they claim that this monster would in the future be, um, well, in our homes. Now, obviously, are the smaller versions. Now, by today, we have much nicer robots. We have done a lot in terms of good robotics. But actually, we haven't come any further in the way we, we want to create robot tasks. Society has totally changed since you'll see in a moment how anachronistic this feels, the futuristic robot scenario, while at the same time you see this family living in a 1960s scenario. But in 1969, they were so certain, just take a few years, that everybody would have the household. So that brings us in robotics, obviously, under well, some form of pressure since it's been now 50 years. And 50 years later, we are still not capable of delivering the futuristic dream of robotics, it's despite literally all of the progress that we have had. And in the end, the key reason behind it is that today it's as difficult to, um, to create this task as it was back then. Sure, more people can do it, angles and so on, but. Um, Programming up this, hacking up this, uh, this robotic scenario, well, you would use very, very similar methods to 1969. You would use very similar uh, control algorithm generation, and all of these things will be would. Well, you can do it with undergraduate students today. You don't need a specialized engineer, but that's pretty much the biggest difference you have in terms of intelligence. It's very, very little difference. And this brings us, of course, to one question that is, well, why have we actually failed in this scenario? Why don't, why have we, why have we failed this scenario? Why haven't we provided these? And um, then you look into where robots have been successful. And it's obviously, first of all, the car and the industry. You wouldn't have a car manufactured in Europe if it wasn't for robots. And uh, even the United States or Japan, this would be all in 
very poor country with manual labor otherwise. But instead we have robots which are accurate to 150 micrometers, which follow precisely the same trajectory all the time. And everything is arranged such that the whole factory has basically zero, uh, it's basically zero uncertainty at the task. Then you look at the other two examples of robots which have been massively been used, which is, well, robot lawnmowers and robot vacuum cleaners. And well, robot lawnmowers typically have uh, the wire leading them along, leading, telling them which is the end of the lawn. And then they do a randomized um, algorithm between these boundaries, or they just follow a wire on the ground. And the Roomba, on the other hand, well, just has a runs against walls and then turns a random angle. And everyone who's had a Roomba knows the first thing you do is you adapt your complete environment to the Roomba, but you remove all the furniture where it could potentially get stuck. So, what do we do in robotics? Well, we typically adapt the task to the robot instead of adapting the robot to the task. And yes, to some extent, because of the robotics environment, you know, sorry, the robotics community, actually having, well, basically a classical engineering background. And while the classical engineering background, you really avoid statistics, you really avoid modeling uncertainty. Okay? Since if you need statistics in physics, well, you've done a bad physics experiment. As Rutherford once put it. So we obviously need somewhat different, but when we talk about learning and robotics, we don't talk about well, supervised learning, but we really talk about scenarios like this year, where, well, there is a robot and we program it because to mimic the human muscles, and we have to actually have it figure out how to generate the uh, gauge such that it actually works. Well, one way of, formalizing, or of um, formulating this is obviously by reinforcement learning, and but you need very, very specific methods and you need to be well, somewhat, um, well, you need to, need to work really for the scenario, for the robotic scenario in this case. So it's slightly different than let's say in data science. What we really want, we want to optimize the scores of the teacher. And um, we want this case. One, one way is we want to do it by imitation, by learning from demonstrations, and the second way by learning from experience. And in the first part, the let me, me skip this. In the first part, we're just trying to reproduce the policy of the teacher, where we really, in this case, try to reproduce path distributions. So where we can fall back actually on well, kind of an active learning where we generate trajectories to match the teacher's trajectory, but we need to nevertheless generate them actively and adapt only the well, policy parameters this in there for, um, for, reproduce, for reproducing the trajectory distributions. And here's an example of that, actually dated. And all the videos somehow have their sound turned on today. Um, what you see here is um, a ball bouncing scenario with the ball and the robot is being charged to well, bounce the ball. We actually thought this was a super difficult task and this super difficult uh, because we totally failed at doing it with classical robotics methods, but it turned out that our imitation learning algorithm learned it on actually just one afternoon. If imitation learning was always enough, well, in this case, we all could um, go, well, go with the PhD from primary school well, into academia. Instead, obviously, we need this painful self-improvement, which you see, for example, when you, well, which you see in motor skills, for example, when you're uh, doing something like, let's say, you learn tennis, and the teacher takes you by the hand, and and he shows you this is a hand, this is a back hand, and you still take several um, hundreds of trials before you can execute the first forehand, the first backhand problem. It's actually the motor control part is quite the hard part of the task. And that's obviously in the domain of uh, reinforcement learning. 
where the T divides is on score. And um, in this case, we don't have access to the path distribution version, but, but only to the path rewards. This makes our problem substantially harder. Since unlike before, we, well, we no longer have access to the to a true distribution. And we have this real problem that we have to execute these things on the real system. And if you could actually build a perfect simulator for a robot, robotics would be solved. Since um, if you can build a perfect simulator, planning methods from classical robotics could solve all the problems you want to. Uh, reality is that humans need really, really good strategies or have really, really good strategies. And these strategies are learned by well, millions of hours of trials and they include a lot of shortcuts. We know on what to focus. We know on what to, uh, we know that catching a ball does not mean just extrapolating where the ball will be and create a physical model of the ball and then uh, predict precisely where the ball will go, but it actually just requires one feature. That is where your ball is on the arena if you look and when you're, for example, running backwards in order to catch a ball. That's a, the humans appear to have this huge set of back of legs of tricks. And when you have these bags of tricks actually in robotics by human insight, you can become really, really good. But how can a robot get them? In the end, a robot can only get them by learning on the real system. So we have a somewhat harder problem here that we want to max the return of the path generated by this path distribution, which we don't know. And um, well, that basically means we have, there is no intuitively easy thing, easy approach. Just taking off the shelf um, machine learning reinforcement learning algorithm, this um, is not doing the job uh, if you want to work with it all. So few trials that your robot can actually survive um, the scenario. And we figured out at some point that this, one of the smartest ways comes actually from human learning, that when humans learn from their own set of trials and an iterated decisions and problems, humans attempt to match not the best taken action, but the reward weighted frequencies of their actions and outcomes. And that can be translated roughly as, can we just create better policies in the reward weighted previous part? In a sense, that just means we do success-driven self-invitation. And well, how would this work? Well, you would basically uh, try to collect the successes, in this case, only symbolized for state actions here, in a single action scenario, a single time step scenario. You would try to capture the density of the good actions, but you would treat the reward like an improper probability distribution so that you do not do something crazy, but you could actually start from a uh, previous invitation. So this gives us a relatively simple problem that has resulted in, well, we introduced it very early on and it's now resulted in most of the state of the art things which are applied in um, robot reinforcement learning. And it basically consists of just saying the obvious things, like we want to maximize the expected return. And we want to ensure that obviously we still have a distribution over the paths. And in addition, we want to trade off the information loss as over the past, uh, well, over the past trials. And variations of this actually produce analytical solutions, including the, the Bellman equation and many famous equations. Um, and in, have enabled us to get really effective algorithms for robot learning. They've resulted also in methods um, of uh, our colleagues into like, like TRPO, for example. Um, and the first time where we applied this is was back, well, quite a while back, where we have now this scenario here, which you see here, where we teach a robot the ball and the cup movement. And um, by imitation learning, but imitations in this case fail because the robot has a two kilogram wrist. It doesn't have hand-eye coordination yet. And so obviously it only, it only figures out, okay, I got to move and well, I get some more reward out of it. But after a few more trials, it figures out very quickly, that the reward increases substantially if you well, move a little bit more um, and insert more energy. And then it finally figures out 
that it needs to catch the ball, as you see here, and after about 90 trials, it actually becomes perfect. How does this compare to humans? Well, humans apparently, eh, well, we, we did a small study on only relatives of my PhD student, and it appears to be that the eight to 10 year olds do not wish to learn it at all. The 10 to 12 year olds already are somewhat better than this algorithm. We have by now way more efficient algorithms, just all the videos, just so much nicer. Our newest algorithms can actually learn in eight or nine trials. Um, so they are better than the old algorithms, but they're slower than um, our newest algorithms. And it have grown ups typically learn it in three, four trials. So it appears to be only me who took three months to learn this behavior. The surprising thing is that this year we my students to look again into uh, well, what algorithm would actually do best. And it turns out that it's um, they're still all based on all the reinforcement learning algorithms which are applicable in robotics and which are yeah, capable of learning something like one-handed juggling with the two balls here, are still all based on this insight of relative entropy policy search. And uh, what my student um, Kai Flöger, together with my student um, Michael Luther, managed to show you can actually learn than just episodes to do well, to do juggling with two balls at a quality level, which was super impressive. So it can actually juggle for half an hour without failing and. Um, the surprising thing is it can actually even juggle blindfolded after having been trained insufficiently. Better here in every episode. So these are separate trial runs that you see here. And um, just to every single time um, it manages to up to 20, 30 episodes. So it's, Pretty much perfectly. It can juggling with one arm and two balls is actually super exhausting. For a human being, the comparable is actually to rather use two arms and four balls. And yeah, instead. So, what we now increasingly obviously do is we compose with behavior uh, using primitive behaviors, which we have just learned. And we put this together with context, a learning execution, and many other things. And one of the things which interests us a lot um, is table tennis in this context. You can learn table tennis either, as you see here, with a combination of first imitation and then subsequently a reinforcement learning, where she the Canarians actually use the ball gun to train the robot. And I'm always saying she actually managed to uh, man she actually managed to uh, train the robot to become as good as she is. And it turned out that this is pretty much the limitation of the Barrett Wham robot for table tennis. It does not actually get much better than that. And the reason behind this is that the Barrett Wham has a well two kilogram wrist. Now I want to see you being nailed at the ceiling, trying to play table tennis, and while being while having a two kilogram weight in your hand, put together with a racket. It's pretty damn hard. So uh, my PhD student Dieter Bichler and I, we set out to build the robot. In fact, the first version of the robot was built 10 years back and then, uh, then before Dieter joined and then later, um, later yeah, when Dieter joined, we actually figured out how to really make it work well. And what you see here is how the robot first trains and it trains against a simulated ball so that we can really start from scratch. And we need quite a few hours um, of, of training against the simulated ball uh, before we really would want to, before we really properly can actually hit a ball. But we accidentally typically hit a ball already. If you take a ball gun and you just aim at the workspace, you accidentally hit a ball after about um, 30 something minutes. And in the moment where the robot has more, well, date, has the first data points, it starts to zoom in. And while all the movement is done on the robot, the ball is only simulated in it because it's simply super exhausting to uh, collect balls arriving every second. He also wouldn't be, they wouldn't also be arriving every second if you were doing this in the human environment. So the simulated ball, it um, goes on a well, 
um, uh, simulate ball, these things still go much, much faster. But most importantly, the dynamics of this robot are so complicated that it would not be capable of learning, of being trained in simulation itself. It can only train to basically to see the ball in this simulation. With subsequent training on the real system, it can become really, really good. And you look at this um, hitting behavior, this is both so impressively good movement, but also impressively high accelerations. And well, we have uh, we've just sent this out for publication. Okay, so it's obviously not all table tennis what we do. In so fact, John, what, John, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but we only have uh, we are over time now, so maybe you oh, can uh, speed up. A I'll bit. wrap up. I have only yeah. two slide and one slide left. Uh, okay. I thought okay. I had 20 minutes, not 15. Uh, it was 20, I think. Yes, and I'm, I'm yep. now at minute 15, so that's why I am confused. Oh, okay. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, so I've actually planned in two and a half minutes for questions. Uh, um, so it's not all table tennis what we do, quite, in, quite the opposite. We actually know that industrial applications will require um, that we, we bring robot learning to industry and well bosch basically at some point had a study where they told us where they told where they figured out that a product needs to be ex both expensive and produced in large numbers for robots to be applicable and manfred gundel the former ceo of kuka basically said present day robots are made for repeating the same task thousands of times future robots will have to perform um, thousands of tasks several times and I think this is also quite important uh, assistive robots, companion technologies in hospitals, rehabilitation, patient, as well as for the robot. With that, I'm pretty much at the end. I just want to say robot skill learning has a lot of implications for cognitive science, where we were also work on um, for classical robotics and for machine learning. And here are some of the other topics where the methods from our, our world are being applied. Um, I'm not going to detail, given that Maurizio wants me to catch up on time uh, for you guys. So in conclusion, I hope I've shown you an interesting scope for how we can avoid possible uh, all the possible scenarios and um, well, learn to adapt to an environment. I hope I've made the point we have fairly efficient imitation reinforcement learning methods for anthropomorphic robots by now, and that our uh, well, things can be reproduced on real systems, even in a robot table test. With that, I'm at the end, and I hope you still have a few questions left. Thank you, Jan. Are there any questions for Jan? So I see there is one question for you on the chat uh, doc. Is the accuracy of on tracking in the table tennis case a limit of the simulation? This is, is the arm tracking and ball simulation limiting to this method? Okay, so uh, um, for this, for the robot, for the Barrett WAM, you need to, would need to, you actually need to figure out a trajectory which is even executable at this high speed without breaking the robot. So it's actually the trajectory generation there already, which makes sure whether you, well, but, where tracking is not the problem, but the if you have a good trajectory, but basically tracking becomes impossible, tracking control, if you um, have a trajectory. For the, it's actually worse for our self-built robot arm, because there you could not precisely follow a trajectory, because it's built on, on insights from muscles, so we try to make it totally overpowered, by taking two contracted, uh, contracting pairs of muscles per degree of freedom, uh, with the result that it can do catapult-like motion, but um, this catapult-like motion needs to be tuned for the actual trajectory. And um, it, you won't know precisely whether you're gonna hit the ball here, here, or here. So you actually have to figure out how to make the system accelerate it up to the point where it could potentially hit the ball. But in order to stately steer it to some location, the learning system has to figure out how to decelerate in this complete region of the trajectory where 
of the ball trajectory where the ball and the racket trajectory overlap. So I mean, humans seem to be very, very good at this. So that in the 1990s, there have been competitions on robot table tennis. And none of these things actually ever became really good for the simple reason that despite that they had robots which moved faster than humans, moved more precise than humans, saw faster than humans. They actually built analog cameras for that to get super high, super high accuracy of the ball tracking in both in terms of the precision of the cameras as well as the speed of the cameras. In every respect, they were 10 times better than humans except for playing table tennis, where they were about a thousand times worse than even worse than our robot, or substantially worse than our robot, for the simple reason that um, they they basically had not figured out what it actually means to be robust in such scenarios. Now we hope okay. to sidestep this question by well starting with the human trajectories if possible and by doing learning where automatically only good solutions should solve. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Jan. Uh, 